Well, welcome everyone, and there is a huge crowd here. I'm not intimidated at all. <laughs> <laughs> there are some familiar faces, and I'm really happy to see so many people that um, I have had the privilege to speak to before. Um, as was stated in the introduction, I am a technical writer. I've been vegan for 14 years, 15 years, and, um, and yeah, I have been in vegan activism for probably the past five or six years. Um, so I'm really excited for being part of this, uh, this, this, this Congress today um, and excited to give a presentation about radical veganism. Um, if I am speaking too fast or because of course I get super nervous and I will start to dash through this presentation. Um, so if I'm speaking too fast, just raise your hand or get my attention, cluck like a chicken, I don't know, whatever. Um, it's totally fine and just like, you know, just signal for me to slow down a little bit. Um, the reason why I wanted to put this presentation together is because um, through my own journey into veganism and specifically vegan activism, um, I had noticed that there are a lot of things that um, many of us don't take into account in order to understand um, or engage with veganism in the 21st century. Um, because so many things have shifted in our understanding of veganism and in animal rights. Um, and we should take these things into consideration. So I did a presentation obviously called Radical Veganism, Animal Liberation for the 21st Century, um, which we're like two decades into now. Um, so yeah, like the, the reason why I wanted to talk about radical veganism is very specific. Um, our understanding of radical things are, it, it's, it's um, in the global west, oh gosh, my hair and the microphone are not cooperative sometimes. Um, our understanding of things that are radical in the global west are sometimes um, misunderstood, um, especially in the United States where I am from. Um, and like a lot of people are intimidated by the phrase radical or radical veganism. And when I've engaged with a lot of people who, are, like, who work with very high profile organizations, some people have cautioned me against talking about a radical ideology. And it's like, oh, use any word but that. That's a very scary word for a lot of people. But I think that we need to reclaim being radical because being radical means returning to the root for a lot of us. Um, and uh, I actually included some quotes that are from some of my favorite people talking about being radical. This is Angela Davis, um, who is a civil rights icon and a prison abolitionist and longtime vegan herself. And she's also the person who's gracing my shirt today. Um, she's one of my favorite people. Uh, yeah, like this quote, I don't know if everyone can read it in the back, and of course I will read all of the captions that are here also. The process of trying to assimilate into an existing category in many ways runs counter to efforts to produce radical or revolutionary results. Meaning that we can't just do the same things or do the conventional things that have given us the, the, like the, the culture that we live in. We need to do things that are radical. We need to embrace radical and revolutionary approaches to, to liberation. Um, we have to act, this is her second quote, we have to act as if it is possible to radically transform the world and we have to do it every day. That is such a powerful quote. It is something that, like, that, that I have to remind myself of every day, all the time. Um, this is something that I never want to forget. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, also, when you are right, you cannot be too radical. And when you're wrong, you cannot be too conservative. People oftentimes think that like, you know, oh, like, you know, this is, this is radical, this is extreme, especially when we're talking about veganism, especially when we're talking about animal liberation. Just the concept itself is very intimidating for a lot of people. Just the idea that animals should be left to li live their best lives is just like, that's radical for so many people. And it shouldn't be, like this should really be easy. In fact, a lot of the things that I talk about in this presentation today are probably going to be confronting for some of us. Um, but like, you know, these, these should not be radical ideas. Um, and there's also another quote from George Monbiot, um, who is in the UK. He actually appeared on the Frankie Boyle show a couple of weeks ago, and this was a quote that he had given us. It says, it is irresponsible right now to be a centrist or a moderate. He was actually talking about in our actions toward climate change right now. We are living in a time that it is an absolute climate emergency for us to take action. Also during this, um, this, this program, he was talking about individual things that we can do to actually have an impact on climate change. And one of the things that he said was adopt a plant-based diet and cut way, way down on our flying. Um, of course, I'm breaking one of those rules by coming here, but insofar as I am able to, I take the train to as many places as possible, um, which is more time consuming, yes, but it's an absolute necessity. 
when we're talking about like our lives and our future on this planet that we share with so many other species. He says the realistic position right now is to be radical. We need to move in a very short period of time. People think that like, oh, well, the way that we need to shift is very incremental, it's very slow, and incremental change is actually what's partially what has gotten us into the situation that we're in right now. We literally do not have time for in incremental change. If you're familiar with Greta Thunberg, who's been like, you know, doing her world tour right now, she tells us, I don't want you to be hopeful, I want you to panic. Act as if the house is on fire, because it friggin' is. Like, you know, this is important. We need to act in a radical way. But we treat being radical as something to be feared rather than something to be embraced. And so people often, like, they, they ask, what does it mean to embrace radical veganism? There are eight, like, principles of radical veganism the way that I interpret it. Um, the, the, the first one and most important one is animals are persons of a marginalized community. That, again, doesn't seem like it should be confronting. But you would be surprised how many people I speak to who don't embrace animals as persons. Um, and these are people who are part of the animal rights community. These are people who are vegan. People like, who, like, who, who believe in, quote, animal rights, but don't really treat animals as though they are part of a marginalized community, who don't view veganism as a movement for animal liberation or for social justice. And that's a problem. Um, like every scientific authority would agree that there are no characteristics that are universally absent in other species or universally present in the human species that would actually confer personhood. And again, this should not be controversial. We look at, um, this is actually a uh, headline from the newspaper The Independent in the UK. Um, Spanish town council votes overwhelmingly in favor of defining pets as non-human residents. This article was actually from 2015. Um, and so like, it's not a very, like, you know, it's, it's not, this isn't something that's happened just in the past five minutes. We've been conferring rights to other species as persons for years. Um, and like in, in individual landmark court cases, we have granted individual personhood to animals. And this is just an example that Spain has granted like personhood to other species. So we recognize that animals are persons under very specific circumstances, but those are limited circumstances instead of recognizing animals as persons universally. When they have culture, when they build societies, when they communicate with one another and have complex emotional relationships with one another, this should not be like, you know, this, this should not be a radical thing, and yet it somehow is. I get confronted by people who who don't think of animals as persons and, and really treat me very in a very hostile way because to them, this is not something that and that's speciesism. That is like that is that that is a hallmark of speciesism to not recognize that the persons whom we are representing or that whom we seek to represent are themselves part of a marginalized community. And this is an important thing for us to internalize also because we need to seek solidarity with other persons who are part of marginalized communities. And I say that as I stand here before you as a queer black person um, from from the United States. Um, and again, like there are organizations who are working on uh, working on on the personhood of non-human um, animals all the time. The Non-Human Rights Project is led by um, Stephen Wise. He is an attorney in the United States who has been working on this for years. Um, my first introduction to Stephen Wise was through his book called uh, "Though the Heavens May Fall." Um, Wise had written this book, which had described the landmark case in, that, like, that that happened in um, the UK in Great Britain that ended slavery, or like signified the end of slavery. That was a misspeak on my part. It didn't um, end slavery. But um, this, the, there was a specific judgment um, that, had, like, that had been handed down. And the, in the judgment, um, the, the phrase was used, like, because people were talking about slavery like, and ending slavery as though this was going to completely wreck society. And the sky was going to fall, and like you know, and like just like cats and dogs would be living together. Up would become down, black would become white, and just there would be sheer pandemonium in the streets. And of course, like you know, in this landmark decision, we use the phrase "and let justice be done." Though the heavens may fall, let justice be done. Um, so like you know, and using that like you know that 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 ideology, using this this understanding of personhood. Um, like he has built the Non-Human Rights Project into something that is an extraordinary organization. Um, this is number two. Uh, radical veganism elevates the perspectives of marginalized persons because we are natural architects of liberation movements. 
And again, like, you know, it will be surprising to a lot of people. Like, when I look at the people who are perceived as leaders in the animal rights movement, most of them are persons who are of European heritage, who are upper or upper middle class, um, who have a lot of the advantages in life, and, and we look at these people as though they are the leaders. And this shouldn't take anything away from the important work that they do, but it's a backwards approach to liberation so far as I have observed it historically. Like the natural architects of any liberation movement are the people who have lived with systemic disenfranchisement and systemic, um, systemic like oppression ourselves. And so yeah, like seeking people who like, you know, who have the most advantages in our society and like elevating those people to, liber to, to leadership positions rather than like elevating the voices of people who are from marginalized communities is in some ways a very backwards approach. Um, Maybe you know these individuals and maybe you don't. We'll actually discuss them a little bit more in the second presentation on digital media for animal rights. Um, like what you're looking at on the left is Logan Paul. Um, he's a YouTube celebrity, take that for what you will. And like, you know, on the right that is, um, her name was formerly Vegan Kalel. Um, she is also a YouTube celebrity. And um, neither one of these people are vegan right now. They were vegan for all of like five minutes and like, you know, they had amassed these huge followings. And yeah, I see like some of you are like laughing because you're familiar with these situations that were, which were absolutely catastrophic. Logan Paul was popular for doing like very insensitive and in some cases overtly racist stunts in order to build his YouTube following to become one of the most popular persons on YouTube. Um, and like, you know, and, and when he had like, this was a person who actually had tased dead rats and had been criticized by PETA for it. And then one day he announced that he was going to go vegan. All of a sudden, everything was completely forgiven. And like, we just had this insurmountable wealth of forgiveness for like certain persons in our society. Um, and like, you know, and, and especially like if they announced that they're going vegan, we just all universally embraced him. Just a couple of short months later, like, oh, BTW, I'm not vegan anymore. And also I'm going to record videos of me like being incredibly insensitive to vegans. Um, and like, and not very much different with with Kalel over here as well. So like, you know, but again, these are the people that we that we raise up to leadership positions. These are the people that we look to as quote heroes so often. Like, you know, uh, again, like people who are European presenting, young, attractive, able-bodied, you know, like be beautiful, like all of these, you know, all of these attributes that like, you know, that that we value in individuals. And like, you know, and the and again, wealth, like you know, but. That runs counter to everything that we understand, not just about social movements, but also psychology. It's natural for like, you know, people who are disadvantaged by society to actually, again, have greater empathy. And that's been demonstrated. This is actually a, um, this is an article from Scientific American. It's from 2012, but I have read multiple, multiple studies on this, that like the higher you are in the social hierarchy, the shorter your social gaze is. And like this has been demonstrated over and over again, and so like, but like the lower you are in the social in the social hierarchy, the like the more empathy you actually have. And so again, why do we elevate other people to leadership positions who have so many advantages? And like we and we don't really recognize the value that people from diverse backgrounds bring, from disadvantaged background backgrounds bring. Again, I'm sorry for stumbling over my words. I do get nervous when I am speaking in front of large crowds. And these are some of the people, like you might recognize the person who's in the center, Trudy is in the room with us and is going to be doing a presentation a little bit later on. These are persons from marginalized backgrounds that don't have quite so much representation in the animal rights movement. On the far right over here, you see Unique Vance, who runs Vegan, Vegan Voices of Color in the United States. This is Ariana Birdie on uh, the far left. Um, she runs Encompass Movement, which actually seeks to help diversify the animal rights movement um, and the animal protection movement through diversity, um, equity, and inclusion work. Um, and again, like you've got Trudy here who like runs um, Crypt Hume Animal um, on, online and is part of so many projects. And like has spoken out um, about, like, about the connections between animal liberation and, and disability justice. Um, over here you've got like Jeff Manns, he actually is in Germany. Some of you may be familiar with him, but again, like he is a queer person. Um, he's also a social psychologist who focuses on like human sexuality and, um, and largely animal sexuality as well. An incredible body of work that is largely overlooked and especially coming from a queer perspective. 
Um, upper in, in the upper right corner, you see Patrice Jones. Um, I saw a couple of Patrice's books on the back, um, on the back table. Um, and Patrice has written endlessly about human rights and about an animal rights. And of course, um, I'm very privileged to work with Patrice at Vine Sanctuary. It's um, a queer run animal sanctuary in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, again, because she's published endlessly, you can read about so much of her work. Um, and, and again, it gets overlooked. And on the bottom, you see Gerardo Tristan, who runs Fawn Axion. Um, so again, like just the diversity of, of, of people and voices that we have in animal rights that so many of us are unfamiliar with and who don't enjoy quite so much representation and probably should be like, you know, more prominently displayed. And we'll talk more about why that is um, and the practical application of it a little bit later. Um, what you're looking at right here, this is the Philadelphia Move organization, which was active from the late 1970s until the, around the mid 1980s in the United States. Um, and the Philadelphia Move, or excuse me, the Philadelphia Move organization is, um, a, and it's still like active um, somewhat, but like the Philadelphia Move organization is a black liberation group um, that also focused on black liberation and animal liberation together. Um, and they had um, a very unfortunate um, incident. Um, it was actually, some people would characterize it as an act of domestic terrorism in 1985 on May 13th when, um, when, when the Move House was actually bombed by the city of Philadelphia. And um, 11 people, including at least five children, um, lost their lives because they were burned alive in this and countless companion animals. Um, this is a quote from Janine Africa. Um, she was part of, is part of the MOVE organization. Um, just talking about the history of MOVE, we demonstrated against puppy mills, zoos, circuses, any form of enslavement of animals. We demonstrated against Three Mile Island, the nuclear power plant, and industrial pollution. This was in the 1970s. These were not very popular things to be doing in the 1970s, especially for black liberation groups during like, you know, this time of black empowerment and like, you know, after the civil rights movement. Um, were some of the like, major accomplishments of the civil rights movement. We demonstrated against police brutality, and we did so uncompromisingly. Slavery never ended, it was just disguised. So again, like, how many people in this room have actually heard of the Philadelphia Move organization? We've got a handful of hands that have gone up. That's sad, this is a part of our history. This is a part of animal rights history. This is an overlooked, under-discussed part of our animal rights history. This is the erasure uh, very important parts of our history. And it's important, again, because these are people who lost their lives because they believed in what they had done. They believed in what they were doing so passionately. And they believed in it and were effective in protesting it to the degree that it scared the state. And the state had exercised an act of violence against them. And this is like, you know, this is what we're dealing with. This, this erasure is part of what we need to correct. And part of correcting that is to behave in a radical way. Um, this is another quote from a piece written by The Guardian by Ed Pilkington just last year. Um, that's an image of John Africa. Um, again, like all of the people who were part of the Philadelphia Move organization had adopted the last name of Africa. Um, and most of them had followed a vegan diet, of course. Um, then there were the dogs. When the 1978 siege happened, there were 12 adults and 11 children in the Move house in Powelton Village. This was before the bombing in 1985, but there was a siege in 1978. Um, and, and 48 dogs, 48 dogs. Most of the animals were strays taken in by the group as part of its philosophy of caring for the vulnerable. Black liberation, animal liberation, the two are as one with move. John Africa was known as the dog man as he was rarely seen without one. Um, in a much longer presentation on digital media for animal rights, I actually go further into the history of the move organization and some of the ways that they were represented in the media because the media was absolutely complicit in the 1980s with the police in vilifying this organization to the degree that like everyone in the, in the Philadelphia area and of course nationally as well looked at them as people that were, that were, that were dangerous, that were criminal, um, and that were deserving of, realistically speaking, being burned alive. We don't have time for that right now, so we won't go into that history. But again, like, you know, this is just a part of animal rights history that largely, like, you know, we don't know about internationally or even in the United States. We think that, like, you know, that, that like, most of the popular activism has been done by people who look more like folks in the, in the audience rather than people who look like myself. 
And that is a danger. That is a real danger because like when you when you engage in these erasures, when we don't see ourselves represented properly in the animal rights movement, then it doesn't really encourage us to be part of it. It reinforces the stereotypes that this is something, an elitist activity that white and middle class people engage in. And nothing could be further from the truth. Most of the time when I talk to people who look like myself, they think that black liberation exists in, in opposition to animal liberation, rather than embracing it as a natural extension of our own liberation because our success, our freedom, it's combined. It doesn't exist in a vacuum, separately from one another. Radical veganism is not intersectionality. A lot, a lot, a lot of people would phrase me as an intersectional vegan. This is being recorded, so hopefully I can show this video to people so that they better understand once and for all, I don't personally identify as an intersectional vegan. It's okay if you do, but I should explain why I don't personally identify as an intersectional vegan myself. Um, intersectionality is a phrase that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. She is a legal scholar um, and she is a sociologist. She's a remarkable, dynamic black woman. Um, and none of what we discuss should take away from that. She's incredible. Um, she had like she had discussed intersectionality where she had coined this phrase um, as a legal concept um, because of she was arguing a case for a black woman who was experiencing discrimination in the workplace. And like there was no way to express the discrimination that she was um, that she was experiencing because there was either sexism or there was racism, but there was no way to actually identify that this is a person who is a victim of both simultaneously. And so she talked about intersectionality by way of discussing, like you know, and unfortunately this failed. Um, by the way, you know she, but she had coined intersectionality as a way of discussing the very unique violations of rights that Black women experience in the workplace and beyond. And of course, you fast forward 30 years and we kind of have like used, we use intersectionality to discuss a broad range of, 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 of intersections or, or commonalities um, between different types of oppression. And um, unfortunately, this doesn't work for me. Number one, although like, you know, she has gone on record to say that she doesn't mind um, that intersectionality, like, you know, it has been used to discuss animality, but Crenshaw herself is not vegan. Um, and she doesn't like you know speak openly about animal rights and for me that kind of disqualifies the use of intersectionality in my own activism again this is not unique this isn't specific to anyone else whatever you do if you like it I love it like that's great but this is just for myself but if she doesn't personally embrace this as part of the spectrum of like of, of oppressions that that like others experience or ways in which oppressor manifests then it's very difficult for me to internalize it as well. Um, plus, um, perhaps more importantly, black women are still experiencing the same type of discrimination that they did 30 years ago. So how I can use this term to actually, like to, to broaden the range of discussion when black women are still experiencing the same outcomes that they did before. And realistically for me, I feel like it is important to include intersectionality in our like understanding of animal rights, but like you know, animals deserve to have a movement that focuses on them, and that's why like I bring it back to radical veganism rather than like you know for myself appropriating a term that was originally meant for another group of marginalized persons themselves. So like if you want to use that term, absolutely do. But this is a reason why, or these are reasons why I personally do not. Um, even though I strongly believe in intersectionality and like, and I think that like, you know, in including intersectionality in our understanding of animal rights is important. Next point, radical veganism does not focus on diet or health. Again, possibly pretty contentious. Why? Because eating animals is the way that most of us engage or the most obvious way that we all engage with animals every day, multiple times a day. Um, but like, I don't, Think that it's productive to necessarily focus on diet because when we allow people to look at veganism as a diet it t things tend to get very very messy um, like people will actually take that and like and, and and absolutely run with it and introduce all types of other types types of derailments into the discussion and we'll get into that a little bit later um, this is actually a post by an administrator for the disabled vegan support group um, when we're talking about health um, health is very specific for a lot of people, um, and, uh, and I will read the text out to you. It's actually on the next slide here, um, and this was a post that, like, the, the Keisha Marie, the administrator, um, had, had, had written that was very personal to her, and it's a little bit long. Running this page is 
really hard sometimes. I get people saying pretty terrible things to me a lot, and I usually don't let it get to me. But for some reason, that's harder for me today. Um, Trudy will probably, Trudy will definitely talk about the intersections of, like, you know, of ableism and, um, and veganism a little later on. But Keisha goes on to say, I'm doing everything I possibly can to be healthy, and I'm still extremely sick. Then I get people saying that my page is bad because I'm sick and vegans need to promote a healthy lifestyle. And I just want to disappear into my small bubble of people who love me. I'm not really looking for anything but to get this out there. I have been vegan for six years this June, and I am, according to trolls, bad for veganism by existing. It just hurts. I want to be bulletproof and confident enough that none of this bothers me like the activists I look up to, but I'm soft and timid and sensitive, and I don't know how to be any other way. And this is part of the reason why we don't focus on health when we talk about radical veganism. Health is such an important thing for every person. Yes, we should absolutely acknowledge that like, being vegan or living on a plant-based diet is perfectly healthy. It is a healthy thing to do for people in, for most people in all stages of life. And it's something that can be used as a tool to, like, to, to help us get past certain conditions. Um, and of course we should recognize that like the eating of animal products exacerbates other conditions But outside of saying that promoting veganism as like a means to quote perfect health is so Enormously damaging to so many people like Keisha and others and so by focusing on health We're actually doing a disservice to people who are a part of our community who don't experience health the same way that we do Or don't even like have the capacity to experience health like the way that we all do individually so no, we don't focus on health, and we certainly don't focus on diet. Um, diet can be very, very triggering for a lot of people, especially people who live with eating disorders. And again, diet introduces a derailment into the conversation that like, doesn't necessarily have to be there. How many people have heard of a food desert? A lot more hands are going up. How many, <laughs> how many people have had food deserts introduced into a conversation where you're talking about veganism by way of invalidating veganism or animal rights? Yeah, yeah, I see, I, I still see some hands that are going up. And this is again a danger because like, and again, like this is probably going to be controversial to say, but like conflating veganism with food justice is for me not the approach that I want to take. Food justice is important, but like food justice and food access and availability of healthy food should not be confused with veganism because it's not a vegan specific issue. People deserve access to healthy food regardless of what diet they follow. And again, like veganism is not a diet. And so that is a danger when we allow people to hijack our conversations about animal and human liberation and make it about food access or food insecurity, that's a problem because everyone deserves access to healthy food. And again, health is relative for everyone. And so yeah, like when we allow people to hijack our discussions about like about liberation movements, like we should work adjacent with food justice organizations. And there are a lot of great food justice organizations out there who are vegan. Uh, Brenda Sanders in the United States, I cannot list all of the projects that Brenda works on because they are there are so many, but she runs the Afro Vegan Society. She runs Thrive Baltimore, Pep Foods, and all of these are vegan and they serve disadvantaged human communities in the United States. A Well-Fed World, run by Dawn Moncrief, is another food justice organization. Um, like there, there are so many, like you know, there are so many food justice organizations that are vegan. But, but again, like to conflate veganism with food justice is a dangerous thing because it allows people to absolutely run away with the conversation and like. Centering the, con the conversation on animal liberation and human liberation is very, very important to me. Um, because once more, like, you know, animals deserve to have, like, they, they deserve to have a, a movement unto themselves. Um, and this is, like, this is a slide that, um, that, that actually is quoting a, um, an article from the, um, the Washington Post. Um, Do food deserts matter? Do they even exist? Um, and this is a misleading headline, by the way, because of course food deserts exist and of course they matter. Um, but again, like overstating food um, deserts or not even understanding what food deserts are and how they are different from food swamps is like, it's a fundamental misunderstanding that people use to invalidate veganism all the time and I just don't want to allow that. Yes? Can you explain what food desert is? Absolutely, for the folks who don't know what a food desert is, I should probably explain it. A food desert is a geographic area where like people don't have access to healthy food in the United States. They're lower income people. 
um, who are concentrated in a specific area who don't have access to grocery stores or food uh, or, or fresh markets or or farmers markets where they can like readily access like you know um, healthy food. And again, this is like this is also I have to say like a very like U.S. specific problem. Um, because when you venture outside of the United States, like, and I'm having conversations with food, with other people in other areas about food deserts, people scrunch up their eyebrow and they're like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. So, like, and of course you wouldn't. Um, and for me, this also manifests as a way, like, a, as an example of American imperialism. Because when you're having conversations, we're in the middle of, like, Europe right now. We're in the Netherlands. And, like, you're having conversations with people about, like, you know, about veganism and animal rights. And then they throw in the food desert card, and all of a sudden you can't talk about this anymore, and like you know, and, and you're frozen in fear because like oh, if, if I don't address the food desert problem as part of my veganism, then I'm probably like you know, then then I'm probably classist or racist or like you know, just introduce all of these, and that's like, and that's what I mean when I say this is a danger, like in our activism because we allow people to derail conversations about animal liberation. By saying like, oh, well, like you know, you're you're classist and you're ableist and you are like you know racist because you don't include this in part of your discussion, and it's like, wow, I would never do that to someone else if they were actually talking about like child labor and the way that my clothes are made. Oh well, guess what? If you're not buying the most ethical clothes from American Apparel, like you know, in Southern California, and the, everyone's making like a livable wage, then I think that you're classist and you're not including people in the discussion. I would never do that, but people feel free to do that to veganism all the time. And so, yeah, like this is like, you know, thank you for, for like asking me to explain that. And I hope it better explains it for other people. Um, this is again, just a quote from the article in Albertson's, one of the Seattle area's cheaper supermarkets. Shoppers tend to be lower income, a measure that's been correlated with adverse health outcomes. They have salads and they have apples. You can't go up them. This is like Adam Dr um, Drumowski from the University of Washington, quoting him now. Um, they have salads and they have apples at this grocery store. You can't go at them saying that they only have french fries and salted foods, so now what? So yeah, like, you know what, even when people are introduced to, like, you know, healthy foods, or when you introduce a healthy food um, market to an area that was lacking it, like, you know, it's not a guarantee that people are going to eat healthy. So overstating, like, you know, the, uh, the, the level of access, which is important, but over in, overstating that importance is dangerous because like it, it doesn't mean that people are automatically going to eat healthier food. Um, like people are going to say, like he, he actually goes on to say in the second part of the quote, the hope is that they will be buying bags of fresh apples, but you can also see the same reaction of, oh, this is great. I can get my donuts mo much closer. Um, that's the thing that, first of all, that happens to me. I'm like, I really am not, I'm totally here for like the, the donuts and the french fries. I'm not going to the store and buying apples. Like, yeah, again, like this is not about like eating healthy for me. I am vegan. Um, I'm probably going to die very soon because I live on a diet of like coffee and french fries and some sort of fried gluten. Um, so like this is like this is my life and, and this is this is health for me. So like, you know, so that's that and that's what it means for me. So so again, like, you know, this is a huge danger. Um, and it's a red flag. Um, when people do this, they usually are not interested in actually having a conversation, a meaningful conversation. They're tokenizing groups of people, um, groups that are already disadvantaged, groups that don't have access, um, in order to avoid having a conversation about how they internalize speciesism more often than not. That's a regrettable truth, and again, it's not very popular to say, but this is a reality for us. Um, radical veganism is political. Again, a really like you know like it seems like a no-brainer to me boy I cannot tell you how many times I have conversations with people where they're saying oh keep politics out of veganism what they really want to say is keep your identity politics out of veganism because they're looking at me and they're like oh here he comes with his like black agenda again or here he comes with his gay agenda again and they would be right because I definitely have those agendas but I have an animal rights agenda also and more importantly and these are vegans who are having this discussion with me. Vegans are really antagonistic to the fact that, like, you know, that this is a political issue for me, and it should be a political issue for all of you. Yeah, what they are trying to say when they say keep your politics out of veganism is keep your black and gay politics out of veganism. Keep your sex politics out of veganism. Um, keep your identity politics out of veganism. Without ever recognizing, once again, that animals are persons. Um, they have identities. They are marginalized persons with their own, like, you know, with their own character. Um, they're not looking at animals as individuals. 
you probably can't see this very well because it's a black and white image and it's very bright in the room, but this was an article in the New York Times that was um, from January, and the, uh, the title of the article is A Black Legacy Wrapped Up in Fur. There is a sense, and then the subheadline, uh, there is a sense among many black women the cultural disavowal of fur has coincided with our increased ability to purchase it. Um, meaning that like, oh, fur has gone down in value with the ability of black women to um, have access to it. And uh, like, when, you, when you look at this, this was actually written by like, you can probably look this up yourselves like at any given time. Um, so it doesn't matter whether I talk about the author or not. Um, but yeah, this was an article written by um, a, a, an author named Jasmine Sanders. And I thought that it was a very curious article at the time that I read it in January and I'm building up to something here, so just stay with me. Um, I'm like, she, like, there was no reason to write this piece. There was nothing, like, you know, there was no outcry at the time. Um, but, like, but then we learned some things later on about, like, you know, about why this article appeared in the New York Times. And let's not even address how difficult it actually is to get an article in the New York Times if you're not a seasoned journalist. And she didn't really have much of a high profile at the time that it was published. So a lot of red flags were going off for me as a person with a journalist background. Um, fast forward to just last week. This is a demonstration out in front of uh, the New York City Council that actually took place on May 8th. Um, I cannot remember who these photos are courtesy of right now. Um, and it's gonna come to me at like three o'clock this morning and I'm going to send out a mass email to all of you. But <laughs> this is like the, the reason why this is relevant is because as it turns out, fur lobbyists have actually been working on mobilizing black activists and black church groups in the city of New York for a while now. They were reaching out to these church groups and they were trying to push the message that like the ban that's being voted on this coming Wednesday on the 15th about whether or not the city of New York should allow the sale of new fur going forward is racist. That's the message that's being pushed by the fur lobby. And that is a message that people have been actually accepting and promoting in my community in New York City makes me fucking mad to think that this is what the other side are doing. And so people like who are vegan say, oh, like keep your politics out of veganism. This isn't a political thing. Like, you know, you want to like you, you want to make this a black thing or you want to be you want this to be about. No, guess what? This is what the other side is actually doing. These are the types of tactics tactics that they engage in. If you orphan people of color, if you orphan queer people, if you orphan queer people of color, in the animal rights movement, the other side is going to actively court them. And they're going to co-opt a message that is actually anti-black in and of itself. Because of what we all know is that European institutions have actually been the purveyors of fur for most of human history. They're the ones who benefit most from the production of fur, and they're the ones who most commonly buy it, even today, by sheer numbers. And so this is an, actually act an actively anti-black agenda that fur lobbyists have actually been promoting, and they've been doing it for months now. And so when I say that we need to actually support the people of color in our movement who are actually doing this work, that outreach efforts to people who look like me are not in vain, and, like, and they're, not, like, they're, they're not wasted, this is meaningful, because if you don't, then these are the people who will win. And look at this. Like again, I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see it, but like, you know, that first image, the one is actually the demonstration itself on the steps of, um, of, of the government building. These are the people who are handing out the signs to these people that they used in the demonstration. Notice what these people look like, and notice what the demonstrators look like. Look at the signs, you can see like, you know, hopefully you can see the red arrows pointing to them. There's an absolute disparity in the people that they are using, that they are tokenizing in order to push their message while they themselves actually get to sit in the background. And, like, and of course, like, what, what, what is the outcome that they hope will happen? If you can convince like, city council persons that something is racist, nobody wants to look racist. And it's easy for them. Why? Because we already have veganism and animal rights perceived as an elitist thing, a hobby of upper class, usually European looking people. We already have that perception. This is an easy win for them. This should have been an easy win for us should still be an easy win for us because we haven't given up hope. We're still working on this, we're still fighting with this. But we need support. We need support from people who have all of the institutional power. We need support from people who have the financial interest, who have the financial power to actually mobilize our communities. And we can't be, like, you know, we can't be, like, 
like disregarded or looked at as a liability or looked at as like, oh, like, you know, this is like, you're, you're trying to make this a black thing. No, this is like, this is already political. The other side recognizes that. The dairy lobby absolutely recognizes that. The people who are pushing meat, they absolutely recognize that. They're the ones who are paying to get like government subsidies all the time. This is absolutely political. And the fact that I still have to fight this battle even now, it is sickening and it's also exhausting. Talk about like, you know, the ways that like, the, the, the ways that we experience like intersecting oppression. Like when you're black and gay and vegan, boy, you've got a long road to hoe. This is a lot of hard work because I've got to get buy-in from the people who are in this room. I've got to get buy-in from the black community and I've got to get buy-in from the queer black community. And folks out there that are like reinforcing sexist, racist, or homophobic rhetoric who are within the vegan community, they're making my job 10 times harder. This is the Coalition for Blacks Prefer. Um, this is actually, yeah, like this, oh, no, laugh, go ahead, because this is absurd. This is another tool of the fur industry, just to like, you know, carry on with the same message. They've got a Facebook group. When you actually look at the Facebook group, this is absolutely hilarious, if not sickening. Look at the, like, you can't, again, because it's very bright in here and like, you know, and the slides are difficult to see, but these are people who are actually part of the group. None of these people are black, I gotta tell you. None of these people are, and so this is laughable. Like, it, it, it is, it's laughable, but it's also completely infuriating to me. Like, again, like, you know, like, recognize the value that marginalized people bring to your community. Like, bring to the animal rights community. Like, these people are actively engaging in digital blackface. I am furious. When I saw this, my blood pressure was at 10,000. I am furious. They are stealing and using and tokenizing my people. This is human exploitation, <laughs> compounded by animal exploitation. How dare they? How fucking dare they? I am so angry about this. So yeah, like, you know, this is definitely a political issue. Radical veganism embraces the broad spectrum of social, cultural, intellectual, and scientific advances we've made since the mid 20th century when European veganism was popularized. Um, we're gonna be wrapping up in a couple of minutes, so I'm sorry that like, you know, again, I'm just, I'm speaking a lot, but, yeah, like a lot of us, like, you know, it's important for us to go back to the root of veganism. It's important for us to recognize the, the value of veganism as it was defined by Donald Watson in 1944. Guess what's happened since 1944? A lot of shit. Like this book on the far right, that's Evolution's Rainbow. It's a book written by um, an actual biologist um, who is also a trans woman, uh, Joan Roughgarden, that talks about the diversity of gender presentation throughout the animal kingdom. How fucking remarkable that we have access to this type of literature in the 21st century that teaches us about gender presentation and gender identity. And like, you know, people say, oh, like this is a new thing, this like, this this, this gender queer kind of like non-binary gender non-conforming, these made up words that like duck, 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 duck. And so people say, oh, this is like, you know, this is like, th no, this is, this is scientifically like, you know, wrong. Um, they are biological essentialists. And this is like, this is the reality of animal biology. This is the reality of gender presentation in the animal kingdom. Um, like, you know, it's, it's widespread. This is so common. Like we talk about sometimes like, you know, like homo ho homosexuality is practiced by like more than 1500 species or it's observed in more than 1500 species, but homophobia only presents in the human species. Um, but there's so much more to queerness than like, you know, than, than, than being gay or same-sex attraction or same-sex relationships. Um, and this book explores that. Um, Franz de Waal wrote the book, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? We've had so many like intellectual advances about like, you know, animal cognition and animal sentience and animal intelligence um, that we need to embrace as well um, about like, you know, our understanding. And a lot of us don't read these books. A lot of us don't engage in like literature outside of the vegan community. If it's not written by a vegan person, then like you know, then this is something that we shouldn't pay attention to, or it's not a part of like you know our conversations. And we need to look outside of our community, um, look at people who are animal behaviorists, um, embrace solidarity with people who are part of the ecological or environmental justice communities, um, embrace like you know the advances that we have learned like you know in, in the past 50, 60, 70 years. Um, in, in all of the knowledge that we have to draw on, regardless of whether people are vegan or not. Animal Madness is a book that I actually use in the classroom. It's written by Laurel Braitman that actually talks about, like, you know, the, the, the ways that, like, zoocosis mani manifests in a lot of animals, um, particularly in zoos, um, and the broad range of psychological conditions that other species are susceptible to. 
Like if, if, if some of us, if we are, if we're fortunate enough to have companion animals at home, separation anxiety in, in dogs, like depression, when like a human or other animal companion um, dies in the family, like, you know, and so many psychological conditions that are again, not unique to humans. We need to learn about these types of things and embrace all of these like advances that we have that we're very fortunate enough to have in our community. Um, again, very important. People are probably gonna like stab me after the presentation because like this is something that like I have to have a discussion about. Animal liberation will not be achieved through green capitalism. What in the world am I talking about when I talk about green capitalism? I'm talking about this. Beyond me, the impossible burger. I love burgers, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, I had loads of like, you know, burger-based foods in the past week alone, last night even. Like when I came here, like I, I want all of these foods. I want the Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I want all of the vegan cheeses. They're all great. But if we think that like green capitalism is going to replace grassroots activism, we have to think again. That has never been the case. That has never been the case in any liberation movement. You can't simply buy your way to freedom. You cannot buy your way out of capitalism with more capitalism. It's great to have these burgers, but like so many people are like, oh, we just create the perfect burger. If we finally have the perfect, everybody will eat this burger. And it's, it's, look, I got burgers coming out of my ass. Like these are like, there are so many vegan burgers out there. Like we, like when the perfect one is never just going to suddenly materialize. Like if, like if, if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. We have amazing vegan burgers now. We have amazing vegan ice creams. Yes, they do make a difference. No, they are not a replacement for grassroots activism. And there is a place for both. And that's something that I think a lot of people who are very polarized on this issue don't really want to internalize. We need both. We absolutely can do with both. And, like, and so this isn't an either or proposition. It's a both and, and we really, really don't get with the both and. It's like, you know, oh, there, there, there is this one way and this is my way and that's it. No liberation has ever been achieved strictly by like one means alone. We're not gonna leaflet our way to animal liberation either. But the people who are very, very pro green capitalism, they ignore the value that grassroots act activism has so often. Um, I know that there are, there's at least one person here who is familiar with Tobias Wiener. He's actually a great person. Like, don't get me wrong. I love Tobias um, and I love having conversations about him because he's white. Um, but, and, but like, and he's wonderful. Tobias, like, you know, his philosophy, he has said on many an occasion that like, you know, I want people to walk into a grocery store or into a convenience store and I don't want them to have to think about what they're picking up. I do. I want people, I need people to think about what they're picking up because this isn't just a one dimensional type of movement because we need people to have access to critical thinking. This type of thinking, this type of thinking that like, oh, people are like, this is, this is dangerous. People are either too stupid or too selfish or too disconnected to actually make a connection, to actually think about these things meaningfully. That's what this type of thinking does. I don't think that. It is absolutely categorically untrue. Green capitalism wants you to think that people are not able to do this. People are not able to engage with their empathy. I don't believe that. That is categorically not true. The existence of all of you fine people in this room proved that it's not true. What we have done over several generations is promote capitalism to, at the expense of everything else so we don't look past the, the individual product that's in front of us. That is the danger of capitalism. We don't see the lineage of that product. Like we just see the actual product. That is what capitalism has taught us. And so no, we don't achieve, like, you know, we don't buy our way out of this nightmare. That is, that is a one dimensional approach. We cannot, we cannot think that. And it's also not demonstrated to be true either. Um, I'm sorry, like I had meant to tell you about that slide before it happened and I forgot. But like that, the next slide is going to have like, like ah, you already saw it, it's a terrible image. But the headline is what's important. Global meat eating is on the rise, bringing surprising benefits. This is from The Economist. This is in no way a left-leaning like, you know, publication at all. As Africans get richer, they will eat more meat and live longer, healthier lives. Um, the next one, this is actually a study. This is a study from 2018. This is very recent. This is just last year. There are multiple studies like this. Um, meat consumption, health, and the environment. And of course, because you can't read the abstract, I actually have it here. Meat consumption is rising annually as human populations grow and affluence increases. 
um, Godfrey et al. review this trend, which has major negative consequences for land and water use and environmental change. You don't have to read the whole thing, but the gist of it is there. Like, yeah, like meat consumption actually is not decreasing, not yet, but it remains relatively stable and has done for the past decade. And it looks like it's going to remain stable over the next decade. The meat industry is not scared of our like products. You know why? For the same reason that the wheat industry wasn't afraid of gluten-free products. We're just adding to the repertoire of products that are available on the shelves. It doesn't mean that there is going to be a huge shift. Because we have gluten-free pasta did not mean that wheat pasta sales plummeted. That is not what happened, and that's not what's scheduled to happen. When you look at all of the trends across the, like, you know, across the spectrum of scholarly resources that we have available to us, the existence of plant-based products does not mean that there's going to be a global shift. What's happening is another product of Western imperialism. Like we may like remain constant or like negligibly decrease our consumption of meat, but Western imperialism has taught other cultures that like eating meat is a sign of wealth. Nigerian people, like you know, like there is uh, actually an article um, in Quartz that's talking about like you know the existence of veganism in um, in, in African countries, like you know, but like it's very difficult for people because they have forgotten their vegan roots. They have forgotten their like vegan lineage because over the past couple of decades, people have looked at the consumption of meat um, and dairy products as a, sign, as a sign of affluence and wealth. This is us exporting our Western values to other countries. Up until the 1800s, like, you know, Japan largely existed as a culture that was, um, that was largely vegetarian because their main religions are Shinto and Buddhism and those are vegetarian religions. And then what happened? The, introduce, the intru introduction of Western culture and Western ideology. And boom, Japanese people started consuming meat products. And that happened again after the Second World War when the war victors were observed eating hamburgers and bacon. Like, yeah, we export our Western values to other part of the, parts of the globe. And the meat industry is very cognizant of this. If we're not going to consume these products to excess in the global West, fine. They'll sell their products to other countries, to other BRIC countries, and like, you know, and other African countries. That is a real thing that we need to be observing and that we need to be mindful of. No, green capitalism alone is not going to save us, and we need to internalize that message. Um, and this is the last thing. Rag radical veganism is the difference between emancipation and liberation. For far too long, we've listened to people use the rallying cry, empty the cages or open the cages. How many people have heard that phrase used? Yeah, like opening the cages, that's great. We open the cages and then what? We need to understand that emancipation is not just simply freeing animals from their cage. It also means decolonizing their land. It also means not gentrifying their neighborhoods. Like 60% of wild animal species have gone extinct. Like this is like we're witnessing a like I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody this in this room because we're all well aware of the lack of biodiversity that we're experiencing right now. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. And this is a real thing that's going on. Yeah, like we can't just open the cages. We need to repopulate the planet. We need to observe ways in which we need to financially and emotionally support animals after they have been liberated. We need to work on health care for other species. Like, you know, we need to work on reproductive health for species. Chickens in the 21st century are nothing like chickens the way that they existed even a couple of decades ago. Why? We've stolen their reproductive autonomy. Like, we have stolen, like, what do we do with these animals after they have been liberated? And that's what I mean when I say that there is a difference between animal liberation and emancipation. We can no longer have conversations about whether or not animals are worthy of moral consideration. They are. Allowing that conversation to progress and allowing that, pro that conversation to continue does us a disservice. We're through fucking playing defense with this. We are playing on the offense now. We are no longer allowing the people on the other side to dictate the conversation. We're not going to allow people to say that veganism is racist. We're not going to allow people to say that veganism is classist. We're not going to allow people to say that veganism is ableist. You know what's ableist? You know what's racist? You know what's classist? The fucking meat and dairy industries, the fur industries that are exploiting the resources on this planet and stealing from people on the other side. You want to have a conversation about intersectionality? We need to include black women who don't live in the global West. Black women who are a part of a, who are a population who are vulnerable to the effects of climate change before we will ever see the effects of climate change happening in the West. We need to have conversations that are much more meaningful and much different 
than the conversations that we're having now. We need to have radical conversations. And so this is the last slide. Solidarity is not a matter of altruism. Solidarity comes from the inability to tolerate the affront to our own integrity of passive or active collaboration in the oppression of others. And from the deep recognition that, like it or not, our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on this planet. Once again, like it or not, our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on this planet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just really quickly, if you want more information about the things that I've talked about here, um, my website is www.christophersebastian.info and if you want to support this work, if you want to support radical vegan activism, um, like please support me on Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash Christopher Sebastian. Thank you again. I am so sorry I ran.